bring a Bible with you to Bible study. If you didn't, we have some. Um, don't be sorry. You didn't be wrong. You just came to Bible class. I couldn't get in. I didn't know I had to come through the church. Oh, okay. I rang the bell. Oh. <laughs> so uh, I think we're still. Are we still. Is that okay? Okay. All right. Um, and and so we're gonna work our way through the Revelation, uh, uh, the last book of the Bible, and it's a book I, I'm particularly interested in because it, it's a book that I, I've come to understand says a certain thing that doesn't isn't anything like what I was originally told it meant. Um, and so most people who've read Revelation have been influenced by a school of thought they don't even know it exists called dispensationalism, which has a certain belief about the way the world is going to end. Um, but if you listen to any prophecy on the radio or, uh, any, uh, or anything, when people talk about the end times or anything like that, it's usually teaching that comes from this perspective. And um, it has, at the foundation of this teaching, certain assumptions that are, that are really problematic. Um, uh, I won't get into all of them, but I, I just anecdotally tell you how I, I first was, was exposed to it. I remember I, I came back to church in um, about 19, early 1980s, I went through a conversion in college, and, and then my, my dad started taking me to a, a thing called the Christian Men's Breakfast uh, thing. It was put on by a guy who would go to that for, it was a good group, I liked it, but a lot of this dispensational and prevailed there, and had a guy tell me, it was about 1984, that he was certain that we were in the seven years of the Great Tribulation. And if you've been around this stuff long enough, you've certainly heard from somebody that they would believe we were in the seven years of the Great Tribulation. And so, you know, of course, you know, that um, scared me as a, as a younger person, you know, like it should, and get all nervous about what you're going to do to make sure, because you don't want uh, the rapture to take place and you'd be left behind, as a certain popular uh, uh, series talked about. But the problem with it was not just that. There was a, there, the book, the writer at that point in time who who wrote stuff about this, um, the most popular guy was a guy named Hal Lindsey, who was, um, had various ways of applying things in Revelation to the events that were going on at that point in time. But I discovered two things as, as, as time progressed. One, uh, well, it became 1991 to three, and I did the math, so clearly we're not. <laughs> Here's the Great Tribulation, and the end did not come. And then I remember things like, you know, in Hal Lindsey's book, if I remember, he was certain that the ten-headed beast was the ten-nation European common market, which then added more nations. So that didn't work anymore. <laughs> and then the next book that came out just reinterpreted the signs. But nobody dragged those people out and stoned them, which is what you're supposed to do with prophets who say things that are wrong. They just got... They just got rid of the old books and got new books, and, and then they were popular again. And, and it just always creates this, um, this um, hysteria about the end of time coming. And it's problematic for a few reasons. One is that when we get all hysterical that the end is coming and it does not come, it discredits the witness of the church. And there's a lot of that around the Jesus movement in the 1970s, Jesus is coming soon happening, and then when it didn't, then people kind of, if you're on high alert, your whole faith is about him coming, he doesn't come, well, okay, you take a deep breath and you go misbehave now, because you're not, you know, you, you got time. Uh, and, and, and that's one reason. The other, the other thing I think that it, it, it does is it doesn't present an accurate view of the Christian hope, that the, the essential theme of this preaching would be that um, there was going to be this destruction on the earth uh, and those who were saved were going to be raptured or taken away while essentially the creation seemed to, to, to it would be promised to undergo some, some kind of, of destruction. And so it didn't, the, the problem with that is that's not really what, what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that, especially at the end of Revelation, if you look very closely, 
Revelation 22 actually presents the completion of the creation in terms that sound very much like a uh, uh, restoration of the Garden of Eden, only its completion. And I think there's a problem, one of the problems with the Christian hope, if it's reduced only to this idea that God's going to blow everything up, but if you're really lucky, he might take you away to some place in the clouds that, you know, you may not really be longing to be there, but it's certainly better than, you know, than the other thing. That, that's not a very compelling vision for the creation. And the church has never really believed that. The church has always believed that in the beginning God made the world and said it is good, there was a fall, and there was redemption, and the end point of our faith is a new creation. The resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come. We long for the completion of the created order, not its destruction. And I think a lot of this doctrine in various ways, it's, it's kind of filtered out, has just undermined the fullness of the Christian hope, has, has made people hysterical about, about prophecies that didn't come true. But then, you know, and, and, and so that, 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 that's a problem with that. And then the more I started reading Revelation, the more I realized, and especially when I got some, some insightful commentaries on it and began to see what it really says, it, it just, a lot of things fell into place for me. And I think can fall into place for a lot of people if you look at Revelation and the New Testament the right way. One thing we do have to be aware of is to understand Revelation, we need some, some history lessons. We need some sense of Bible history by way of introduction. And I, I think it's helpful to understand, I'm not going to do a lot on this timeline, but I do want to start with something. Um, so when... Um, does anyone know about when Abraham lived? Huh? 4, BC. A little sooner, a little. Here, here's the rule of thumb for Abraham, circa, is he lived about as much before Christ as we lived after Christ. Okay. Abraham's about 2000 BC. And then um, we have uh, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes, and then we have somewhere here we have we have Moses and the Exodus. Now this is a the dating of this is is a matter of some, some dispute, uh, but I'm going to put up what is the traditional date, although a lot of more modern scholars prefer a different date, but within even a, a, a 100 or 200 years, you want to know when the Exodus took place? 1500. Okay. So I'll, 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 I'll pitch that down to maybe 1450 BC. These are all BC. <laughs> It's okay. You cheat. You still looked at it. You found it, right? I, I, you give take-home tests, then people have to learn it. You give a test, if I get the wrong answer, oh, you got it wrong, you didn't learn it. So, um, And then, um, so, if the Exodus here, this is where God made a covenant with, with the people. He made one, there was a covenant with Abraham, but here was the, the, the covenant with the law, uh, the Torah. And um, what was, what was God's covenant with his people at Mount Sinai? What did he say? Here's the commandments. Take commandments. Take commandments. Okay. So, so, so first of all, the thing to understand is that before God gave any, any commandments or Torah or anything, he, he went and saved Israel and chose this nation, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the 12 tribes, brought them out of slavery and brought them to Mount Sinai. My, the law was given after they passed through the Red Sea, went to the wilderness, and created a covenant. And, and he, the covenant was not, as it's often understood, that the Old Testament is all about, you have to keep these rules for God to like you. That was not what the Old Covenant was. The Old Covenant was just like the New Covenant. God chose Israel based on his own choice, said, you're my people. And now that you're my people, here's the way I want you to live. And the Torah means not law in its original meaning, but instruction. Here's the way I want you to live. And, and so what, what God required of Israel was, was faithfulness to, to the Torah, to, 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 live, um, to live that way. Then, then a couple other dates on here to note, so I want to get quickly to the end of the 
Uh, king David was the first king. Any idea about when he is? 1,000. 1,000. We've got a chronology here. <laughs> okay. Um, I do that anyway. And we were, those of you who are reading the, the morning offices now and, and the lectionary that we, that we read, we just read how um, David had a son, Solomon, who had a son, Rehoboam, who just you know, blew it. And, and uh, the kingdom got divided into two, uh, north and south. Um, um, And this was about um, somewhere in the 900s, about nine, I want to say it's about 930 BC, the Bible kingdom. And then um, eventually we're going to get to the, to the, the sort of climactic event at the end of the, of the Old Testament, not the very end, but, but um, which is judgment on Jerusalem. And forgive me if you expect to read my writing, you just have to, it's a gnosis. That you just have to kind of know, <laughs> and and that judgment that came on Jerusalem happened. What time? What was the date of that? It was actually um, five eighty six B C, and back here in actually. Um, Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom, and the judgment there was 722 BC. So the kingdom was divided here, and then the first kingdom went went away there, and then uh, the judgment on Jerusalem was in five. The, the Babylonian army invaded Jerusalem, took a lot of Jewish people into exile, and um, and then um, at the end of the Old Testament was a rebuilding of the temple in 515 BC. And, but it never regained its former glory. Uh, and it was that rebuilt temple that, that is standing in the New Testament. That, that temple got um, a couple notes that I don't want to get too far afield from the basic points, but, but they, when they rebuilt the temple in 515 BC, it wasn't very impressive. But in the century before Christ, King Herod, in order to curry his favor with the Jews, did a remodeling project and made it. So when Jesus in the in the New Testament, when the disciples say to Jesus in the New Testament, don't you see how beautiful this temple is? That's because of what Herod did to make it beautiful. But it wasn't beautiful for a lot of you. It was just paltry in comparison. So in this period after the kingdom, we, we have prophets who come to Israel and prophesy that the people have not been faithful to the covenant. They've been unfaithful. And the end result of that unfaithfulness was this, where the temple was destroyed and uh, the people were taken into exile. So in the New Testament, um, Jesus comes and there's a parallel event here in the New Testament where there is again a judgment on Jerusalem. And when does that take place? 70 AD. Or actually, I think it's proper to say 80, 70, because it means in the year of our Lord, 70. Or it just means 5, 80, 64, so that's how that goes. But, <laughs> but now they say they all use this terminology, the common era, because you can't have Jesus in the time, even though it's all, even though it's all determined by him, you can't say it. Um, so, so this happened here, and when, when did Jesus die? Yeah, maybe 30, you know, Two. circa 30 to 33. Okay. And, and so, um, now, what's really the, the truth for most Christians is that this event in AD 70 is kind of a missing element in most people's understanding of the New Testament. Um, it's a missing element because it marks a judgment on Jerusalem that's essentially parallel to this. These were the Babylonians, the pagan army, was the arm of God's judgment here. Here was the Romans. 
two pagan armies as an ancient objection. But in both cases, the temple was completely destroyed. And in both cases, it was made very clear that the result of this was the result of the people not responding to God. But almost nobody knows about this or thinks about this. Instead, people will think, well, the Old Testament God, he was this mean God who used to judge people. But Jesus was all about love. And Jesus was about love. But the Old Testament God was about love too. <laughs> there's not really an essential difference in, in the, 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 the um, character of God from Old to New Testament. In the New Testament, certain things are drawn out more clearly. But, but, but this, this is something that, that we need to bring into focus and to, to understand the New Testament. And I'm going to read some things that Jesus said here in a second about it. But um, in AD 70, the temple was destroyed and there never has been a temple again. The difference between this and this is that this was a judgment on Jerusalem that was provisional, but Jerusalem, they came back and they returned. They were sent to exile and they came back. This was final. This was the end of the Old Covenant. And as you'll see, the word, the end of the Old Covenant, age. That's an important concept. So they, there was, this was a judgment that they rebuilt. There was a chance to repent. Jesus came in fulfillment of all this happened here. And the result was they rejected him. And the result was an act of judgment. Um, so let me, let me read, if you have a Bible, you can open up to uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 34. And here, here is Jesus prophesying the destruction of the temple in AD 70. Um, Therefore, this is Jesus, Jesus, Matthew 23. Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. Matthew 23. Um, another passage to, to take a peek at would be Luke chapter 19, verse 41. This actually is our gospel for a Sunday, or it was a, for a, a couple Sundays ago, maybe a month ago. Luke, what? Luke chapter 19, verse 41. <clears throat> now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. So, two passages where Jesus makes it clear that the consequence of Jerusalem's rejection of him was going to be the destruction of the city. And, as he says in Matthew, this generation. Now, in, in the Gospels, uh, there are these passages that, that are called, that, that, go by, that go by the name of the Olivet Discourse. Um, the Olivet Discourses are, you, you can't turn to three, I'm just, I'll just tell you, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. 
they, they're the same story just by the three different gospel writers that we call the synoptics because they look at the story the same way. Um, turn to Matthew chapter 24, though. I'm going to look at that, at that just for a second to make the point I want to make. Matthew 24, verse 1. Matthew 24, verse 1. Then Jesus went out from the temple, and his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you see all these things? Assuredly I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, in, in the popular prophecy teaching, as you read through Matthew 24, there's always been a confusion about what Jesus is talking about here. And a lot of people think, well, he's talking about the end of time and his second coming. And this is what leads people to to displace some of what he says from the context, from the actual words he uses into something else. It's also the fact that in in the verse he uses prophetic language, which is often misinterpreted. But... In his plain, the question is, what, when will these things be? What things be? The temple will be destroyed. Okay, and here's, here's something that is confusing. The sign of your coming and of the end of the age. One of the big misunderstandings here is that the coming that Jesus is going to talk about is his coming again in glory at the end of time. Where... Um, I believe, and I believe that the Bible is, is, supports this, and we'll see this in Revelation, that what he really means is his coming in judgment on Jerusalem. And the end of the age is not um, in, in, the, that's in, in the view here for Jesus, is not the end of time, but the end of the old covenant age. Once we get that into focus, the chapter begins to fall into place. If you go down to, I, want, I just want to highlight one other thing about this, this, this chapter that will support this, I think, when we take the plain sense of the words. Matthew twenty three thirty four. At the end of the discourse, after he communicated the various signs will accompany the temple's destruction and the end of the old covenant age, Jesus says, quote, Assuredly I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. What's happened with that sentence, the, 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 the teaching I heard in, in hearing prophecy was, what it meant was some future generation that sees all these signs. Or there's a lot of fancy ways to do it, but if if you just understand and take Jesus to saying what he clearly is saying, and he used the same words back in Matthew 23, upon this generation, all all, will come all the blood. Here he says, this generation will not pass away, by which he clearly means the generation I'm now speaking to. And I just want to highlight in the Bible the generation is 40 years, and if Jesus is talking here, within 40 years, all those things took place with destruction of the temple in 1870. Once we understand that basic framework of chronology, all of the fancy footwork we need to do to dance around and, and, and displace the things Jesus is focusing on to, to some future time, go away, and it all makes a lot more sense. Can I ask a question? Yes. The, people, the disciples are asking this question. Yes. If they're really referring to the end of the age, they don't know about the end of the old covenant age, do they? It's a good question what they meant by that. Um, you remember the disciples had um, a few different um, uh, 
misunderstandings that they had to uh, work themselves through. For example, on um, at the Ascension, um, they asked Jesus when he ascended, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Um, so exactly what they meant when they asked him what would be the sign of coming at the end of the age, um, they did not yet understand how his crucifixion and resurrection fit into the whole scheme of God's plan. They, they were still thinking at that point in time that Jesus was going to somehow re restore Israel and the judgment that would come would come on Gentiles and Israel would be restored. So I'm not sure they really understood exactly what they were asking. What I believe, though, is Jesus' response is, in terms of what Jesus is saying, the sign of my coming. And hold on to that thought about his coming. We're going to say a lot more about the coming of Jesus. That, um, that seems to be... Yeah, please, please. That seems to be critical to the, to the understanding of the language of being at the end of the age. And it comes from where I think, I think what you're alluding to is the, the coming language, which is straight out of the prophecy of Daniel. Right. Um, and so the, and that, that, that's where that language comes from. So it was like theological jargon of the day mm -hmm. worked into um, um, what, what to expect at the end of a desolation um, delivered to the prophet Daniel. And then it's it sort of in the, in the common parlance of um, a religious folk in, around the time of the disciples. So they're, they're using like a prophetic language that was well known and frequently taught about and would have had a special uh, place in the hearts and minds of people living under Rome um, because it was originally delivered to those living under Babylon, um, specifically Daniel and the rest of the people in the, in the captivity living there at that time. And referring constantly to the end of the age was when is the captivity going to be over? When are we going to be restored to, um, to when, when is everything going to be restored? Um, so that, that language and, they, and they, the coming of the Son of Man language comes straight out of Daniel around uh, chapter 7 through 12 in Daniel as well, which I think that's where you're yeah, so, so we're going to get in, in, in Revelation, in chapter 1, and he's going to say, behold, he's coming with clouds. And then we'll have another image in Revelation of, 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 of him coming with clouds. And at that time, we'll have a large discur discursus on what it means to be coming with clouds. Um, but I'll give you a hint. It doesn't mean visually that Jesus will be descending with two feet on a cumulus nimbus. <laughs> it, means, it means cloud is, is a prophetic stage prop that cues when he's talking about what's happening in Daniel 7, where one like the Son of Man comes with the clouds. And, and it's a whole framework for understanding that we will unpack a little bit more at that point in time. The other thing I would say is that um, the other uh, coming too is that the word coming in Revelation we used a number of times. <clears throat> For example, in the prophetic language to the churches, the letters to the churches, Jesus says to them, um, if you do not repent, I will come to you. There's a way he would come to a first century church, presumably in judgment, that wasn't his coming in glory at the end of time. So part of our stumbling over the idea of the coming of Christ, that if we only say there's only one time he can come and that's at the end of time, the fact is we think Jesus comes a lot. He comes to us at the altar and the sacrament. He, he comes to us in response to our prayer. And he comes in judgment at points in history. This was a coming in judgment on Jerusalem. Even though the agent of judgment was the Babylonian army, God makes it very clear he, that's what he uses. But it was him doing it. And, and, and the same thing happens here. Yes? What about the, all this stuff that says the moon won't give its light and stars will fall from heaven and the moon will turn into blood and all that stuff? Yeah, yeah, that's, and I'll let Hayden wait and after I have, uh, is, that's prophetic language. Okay. It, it, they're sort of prophetic stage props. What it refers to is a cosmic change, a change in the cosmic order of things. And what's changing in the cosmic order of things here is 
the old covenant age is ending and the new covenant age is beginning. And we're going to see in Revelation the essential replacement for the temple, which is the worshiping community before the throne of God. Worship is now going to be... Re- the worship of God, the authentic worship of God is going to be relocated from here to, uh, to the church. And the church, what the, how the church worships, that's really the center of Revelation, is the worshiping church ruling with Christ over the creation. And at all of the judgments that come in Revelation come in response to the prayers of the church offered before the throne of God. We'll, we'll, we'll see that. Well, it just reminds me, too, of, did Jacob, um, when, he, Jacob Joseph, when he had the dream, that he saw stars when they were bowing down to him? Yeah. And he was, I don't know what, and he said, I don't know what else about that one. But it just reminded me of that when you said that, cosmic mm-hmm. order of things. Like, we saw the stars, all the 12 tribes at one point, and then, I don't know. Well, and, and the thing, again, we said that is, we, we have to understand that the prophetic language is, is highly symbolic language. And um, so we have to understand, when we get to that, because we, we will get in the text of Revelation to the moon turning into blood and the sky and all that kind of stuff. When we do that, we can go back and look at the Old Testament that the... At the, there's several passages where that same language is used. We'll see in the Old Testament that when it was used, it was used for some of these past events too. The day of the Lord comes, it's this cosmic um, action that has, uh, action has cosmic significance is what that really means. Paul. Don't people try to read more than what they are absorbing or, or try to read more into what they're trying to absorb? Well, with Revelation, yes, people read a lot of things into it. I, I think there's actually, um, I don't think, Revelation has a lot of deep things to say that take long meditation. I don't actually believe that Revelation is that hard to understand. You just have to be able to approach it through the medium it's written in. And it's written in, in language of signs and symbols. So what you have to do is say, okay, we see a, a, a sign or a symbol uh, or an image. Where does it come from? And in almost all cases in Revelation, it comes from the Old Testament somewhere. And we go back and say, well, wh- what does it mean there in its original sense? And how is it being developed here? So, so, for example, to give, to give a, a simple thing, which, which isn't as much of an Old Testament reference, we'll see, um, uh, well, I think it's in Revelation, but it certainly is, the, the, you'll see a creature with eyes all over its head. It's like, ah, oh, it's the hideous. Okay, before you do that, what does that mean? What does it mean to have eyes all over your head? Clearly, this, is, this, is, this means that this creature can see all directions and everywhere. So we don't want to get into literalism of assuming that, that the creature is hideous, but, but that it has an ability to see all things. That's what's being, if we understand, that's what it represents, that's what it means, aha, this sees everything, okay. Jesus' eyes are like a flame of fire. He has a, a look that pierces. Oh. Um, I took an Old Testament class once uh, from my favorite professor, Nancy Heidebrecht, over at, uh, she used to be a vanguard, but she, she once handed out the Song of Solomon for Literalists. <laughs> it, 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 you know, the poet thing, you know, my... My beloved, her breasts are like two deer that, you know, and, and so she had all of the images literally portrayed on this thing, and it was just hideous creature. Because an image conveys something, but it's not meant to be taken literally, it's meant to be taken symbolically. And you have to understand what the symbol means to get at what it means. And once we get, once we do that, once we stay in that framework, Virtually everything in Revelation can be under, we can understand what it's pointing to. I mean, for example, one simple thing, we're going to immediately get these creatures in, um, 
in uh, the, the living creatures in, in Revelation. Who are these strange things? It's not that, it's not a mystery. These are the cherubim. They're present in the Old Testament, and they reappear here. The images are slightly different, but, but clearly this is what, because why? Because the Old Testament tells us that God dwells between the cherubim. So we're going to see God, we're going to see the cherubim. There they are. This is named straight out of the, of the Jewish temple and, and the reality of heaven upon which the Jewish temple was built. It's not strange. It's not hard to understand. It's, if you're deeply rooted in the Old Testament and what, that's, what those signs and symbols meant, as all of John's readers would have been. So... When this happened, this, this, this event happened that um, culminates uh, the Old Covenant Age and the dawn of the New Covenant Age. Of course, the Gospel stories all end with um, you know, the, the, some, the resurrection, partly the ascension. The epistles uh, are, are mostly written before A.D. 70. Um, but it wouldn't surprise us then I think if we understood the significance of this event, to find at least one New Testament book whose focus was on that. And I, I believe that's the, the essential focus of Revelation, which I think the inter, internal elements of the text can make clear as we move through it. I'm not going to say it doesn't have any application beyond this event, but clearly uh, it, ha it, it has that event in focus. Josephus says that when this happened, uh, the, and if you want to read about the events leading up to it, the historian uh, Josephus was a Jewish historian who wrote the Wars of the Jews, and the, but he, he, wrote, he wrote a history uh, of, of this age. He describes what it was like in Israel up until this time. He says that a million people were killed in this destruction. My Hebrew professor, there weren't that many people living there, but numbers aside, it was a catastrophic event. Most people are aware of, uh, or heard of this event through the story of Masada, where the Jews who fled the temple went and committed suicide on a plain over by the Dead Sea. Um, but I, there's, there's, I just want to remind that we have to be aware of the reason that they were therefore in the context of all that's said here on a plane over by the Dead Sea running from the Romans is they didn't know the time of their visitation. They didn't what? Didn't know the time of their visitation. Mm -hmm. The Messiah had come. God had spoken in this geographic area, here I am, and they had said no. That's a hard thing to find. God acts in history. And, and one thing we're going to get from Revelation is when God speaks and calls us to follow, we must respond. And we're going to get that about Israel because this is a, a, a judgment that concludes the Old Covenant age. But we're also going to get it in the letters to the churches, the new people of God. God says, now I'm talking to you, and they're prophetic. Here's what I see wrong. Clean it up. And he means it. This, this God. So, so sometimes, and this is something that's very important for us to understand as contemporary Christians, because sometimes our faith is very, tends to be very, what we call Gnostic. That is, it tends to be separated from time and history. And we have the sense that, that God, we, we sort of ignore all this and act as though, well, God would never judge. God, yes, God will. God does all the time. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He judges the world and right. All people who do bad things are always eventually judged. And he's going to come at the end of time. That's what we think Jesus is going to do is to set the world right. We're, we're not just going to die and go to heaven. And the, you know, there, there's, there, there's, there's a beginning and ending to the story, and these are some of the details of the interim pieces. So that's an essential framework. What, 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 I, what I, I will, and this is, this is I, you know, 
what I'm, the way I'm going to present Revelation is um, I don't say that all the people of Revelation uh, agree with this, although the, I would say this about Revelation, um, that, there's, that there's movement towards the position that I think the text is pretty clear about, that this proposes that Revelation then probably was written in um, somewhere around A.D. 68. And that John's Gospel is sometimes written uh, somewhat later. Um, some people say as late as the 90s, but one thing I'd say about New Testament dating is nobody knows. Almost all of it is theory that gets re regurgitated and then it's repeated enough textbooks it becomes fact, but nobody really knows. Um, I would say something too about this just to, by way of, of observation. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke have these things called the Olivet Discourse that talks about destruction of the temple. John's Gospel does not have anything that refers to it. Why? Well, if he'd written a whole book, it was like a massive Olivet Discourse before he wrote his gospel to make a certain amount of sense. Also, there might be something cryptic in John's gospel. I mean, I'm just throwing my little things that are not you know, provable, but in John's gospel, whereas in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the, the cleansing of the temple comes at the end of the Palm Sunday march, and John's gospel comes at the very beginning. And the cleansing, as N.T. Wright points out, is probably not the cleansing, but the marking for destruction so maybe a, a clue in John's Gospel that the temple, he, he, he sees it already as irrelevant. Any questions about that? Challenges? Yeah, you don't have to agree with me, incidentally, but uh, um, I, I challenge you to look through as we go through and, and, and um, examine these things to see if they're so. Um, some themes of Revelation to highlight as we go through before we jump into the text of chapter 1. Uh, a central theme of Revelation, and this is something I think is really important uh, for, uh, for people to understand, is, is it, it shows that worship is at the heart of the universe. And that the worshiping and praying church re reigns with Christ through its prayer and worship. Revelation can teach us that. In fact, we're going to see that Revelation is, in fact, a kind of liturgy itself. There's a way that the Revelation actually unfolds uh, in the, according to the pattern of the Eucharist. It's going to start with the liturgy of the Word, letters to the churches. There's going to be a sort of sursum corda, lift up your hearts. The angel says, John, come up here. And he immediately comes up and he sees the cherubim singing holy, holy, holy. And then we're going to see the revelation as a lamb as though it had been slain as we at the altar remember the sacrifice of our Lord. And so worship is the center of everything. And one thing revelation teaches us about above everything is that that's where our, our principal power as Christians lies in our worship, in our prayer. There's a pattern of sevens. And we didn't, I, didn't, I didn't say anything up top about uh, who wrote Revelation. There's a lot of theories, but the, the most ancient theory and the, the most plausible thing is written by the Apostle John, who also wrote John's Gospel. There are other hypotheses. However, one of the ways you connect is John's Gospel is also characterized by sevens. And Revelation characterizes sevens. And, only the Lamb of God is only mentioned by John in those, in those books. There's so many common themes that, that, uh, that link them. Another theme of Revelation is that Jesus is Lord of all creation, not, not just of believers. He calls everyone to repent, even Caesar. And Revelation is not a book of destruction, it's a book of conquest. It's a triumphal book. It is good news. It ends with the completion of God's new creation. It says that God will complete what he has started. 
Um, it's a revelation is a covenant document. It um, it gives God's case against Israel just like the prophets of the Old Testament. <coughs> Um, another th- so, and another point about Revelation, I think, is that the future application of Revelation has to do with the repeating processes of Scripture. So we'll see that just as um, there was there was a prophetic ministry in Israel. Le- to which there was no response leading to judgment on Jerusalem. So Jesus came as the prophet who preached to Israel and after a lack of repentance or judgment on um, Jerusalem in the end of the Old Covenant age. So we're told that Jesus will come again in glory to judge the world, but what, what happens in a localized manner in A.D. 70, we're led to believe will happen in a global manner at the end of time. And we would expect the patterns to be similar. So this is what, why prophetic language often can live on different levels. It can apply to here and can apply again to here. Um, so, for example, in the Old Testament, one of the prophecies, like of the virgin birth, behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son who calls him Emmanuel. If you go back and look at um, Isaiah, in context of Isaiah, that has to apply to some child born within Isaiah's lifetime. The original horizon of that is a child will be a sign of Israel's immediate deliverance from an adversary. But there's a secondary horizon of that prophecy that's ultimately in Christ. And so that kind of phenomenon will happen in Revelation that the enduring uh, application, I believe, to future things has to do with this repeating pattern where, where things that are true here are also going to be true of things later on, these symbols. Uh, so the symbols of prophecy can often apply in different levels at different times. But the attempt to 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 take the symbols of Revelation and tie them into some period of history saying that this nation represents that is always problematic. And in my brief experience, has almost always, has always been proved wrong, just time has to go along. So, uh, and it doesn't help the gospel because it makes us seem like we're crazy because we know what we're talking about. And it's not what it says. <laughs> And then, um, just finally, to, to, to reiterate what we said a minute ago, is that um, it's a symbolic book, so to interpret it, we're going to say, what, what is the symbol? Where does it come from? What does it mean? And from there, we'll get our interpretation of it. And in almost all cases, the symbol can be located in the scriptures. And... Um, and we'll, we'll find out where it comes from and we'll develop it from there. Any questions about that? Hayden, want to answer that? Yep. Hayden's my, my, my you know, partner in crime here. There's, there are weeks when I might be traveling. Hayden will lead the class, but any, feel free to jump in any time. Uh, if, if you have any questions, comments, anything I'm saying, please do. I'd rather discuss this a little bit and, and hear the, the, the real questions you have. Um, but... I think this is a necessary background. Um, and it also, yes? So am I correct in what you were saying that the direction you're taking this is really kind of a, a newer or contemporary idea on revelations? Is that? Actually, actually no. This is, no? This is maybe okay. one of the oldest ways of looking at revelations. Okay. But, um, okay. Yeah, this this is seems to be, from what I can tell, the way that the like church fathers would have read it. Um, they would have read it in, in in context of the immediate and then through that lens look to the look to the cosmic um, and understanding the genre better. Um, they, they, they they have they have a very different reading than a lot of the more contemporary modern theories. The ones that we brought up earlier, the kind of dispensationalist view, the sort of the, the, the sort of rapture focused view, those those ones that fixate on like a 
trying to establish a linear historical sequence to all of this. Those actually didn't come around until fairly recently in time. If I'm remembering correctly, dispensationalism sort of came around in the mid 1800s. Yeah, that's right. That, that's yeah. kind of with the Adventist movements that came up there, and then theories yeah. came out of that, and and um, and 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 the reason. So, I mean, the reason it's been significant for me is simply that. I was I, I came back to faith when this dispensationalist teaching was very rampant, as many of you did, and was influenced by and heard all this stuff. And so when I finally found some sanity, like what this really means to some good sources, it just like it helped me because I always had those same questions. You know what what's talked about the end time? What's here? G, you know, G, and, and when I finally found some authors who, who, who explained it, it's like, oh, it makes a lot of sense. And now I get it. So, um, so Bishop Scarlett, uh, yes. if, if, we are, uh, if we are also influenced by, by this dispensationalism, which most of us all have been for so many years, so when we, when we try it, when we relearn it from the context of him speaking uh, mostly about this destruction and, and um, it took place at, at, in the temple in 1870, then how does that relate to the resurrection, the final resurrection? Yeah, so, so I, I, think, I think the um, the main theme of Revelation, I think, is the, is the sovereignty of God and his control of history. And I think what we actually get from, um, in Revelation is you have these historic events that would have been chronicled by someone on the ground in a certain way. I think in Revelation, when we come up here, we see what these events look like from the vantage point of, of, of the presence of God. And, and, and so, I think as we understand the sovereignty of God and his rule over all things, including um, the judgment that comes on Jerusalem, what we get, what we should embrace is, is, is a renewed sense of God's sovereignty over all things now. And how we live in a world that has a lot of, of disorder, a great deal of anxiety, especially among Christians about what's happening, where are we going? And I think Revelation is a book that teaches us to trust and to be, um, to understand that just, that God has always been in control. Um, and Revelation tells us how out of the chaos of, of, of Good Friday, God, God has brought about his new creation and what this looked like from that standpoint and should help us to, by way of application and analogy, to understand how out of the chaos of our world and, 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 and through our prayers as the worshiping church in this world, all that is amiss will be overcome and conquered. I think that's the, that's the primary message of Revelation, that our prayers, our faithfulness, and our perseverance will conquer. We're going to win. Not even death can conquer. Can, can death, death has already been conquered. So, and that's, that's another thing that I think that the early Christians had. They understood that, so they weren't afraid to die. I think we have great anxiety about death. Even Christians were, were very, um, we, because we're unsure about God's sovereignty. We live in a world in which, um, which our, our, the, the stuff of life has kind of been separated from faith, and faith has been put over here in a compartment, you know, and, and um, I think Revelation's encouragement to, to, you know, to, to bring God back into the center in our worship and understand his and, and to embrace his rule over our lives right now. So I don't know if that Ben if that was a yeah. yeah okay. So 
this AD 68 date bothers me. So John was in exile on Patmos. Is there his, it, uh, historical evidence that supports that 68 date that he was in you mean Patmos? You mean that, that to know he was in exile on Patmos? Yeah. I don't think there's documentation that he was in exile on Patmos either in AD 68 or in 90s when they normally say he wrote it. But there certainly was um, the persecution of Nero in the 60s and there certainly was anti-Christian sentiment that could lead, that, that, that certainly would understand why, why a Christian leader uh, at that time would be in exile. Yeah. We're talking within like a 25 year span yeah. between the early dating of Revelation and the late dating of Revelation, um, which is, a, you know, as far as ancient documents go, pretty, pretty close. Uh, and jo Josephus <laughs> doesn't mention no, no, he doesn't. No, <clears throat> Josephus's concern is is, is uh, elsewhere. Um, Josephus does talk about the the emergent Christian community, um, but doesn't speak about it as though there's a whole uh, idea of what it is. Um, and is in his, the center of his concern in one of his books is with chronicling the conditions that give rise to the Jewish civil war, um, though the Jewish wars against Rome uh, as well. Yeah, so, so it, it, it's it's not it, it's not surprising that he doesn't sort of dive dive into the dating of, of the writing of the biblical text. He's not really concerned with it. He's not particularly concerned with Christianity, um, mm -hmm. other than mentioning its sort of sociological uh, place yeah, over and against Rome, yeah, and and, and the Jewish state uh, within Rome. Yeah. yeah, there's a question of date, question of author, but does it really matter? Does it really matter? Who wrote it? The fact that it was written, it does what it does. Does it matter if it was 68 or Well, if, if they're prophesying the destruction of the temple in AD 70, it matters if it was written in 68 or 95. Yeah, true. Yeah. Well, or, or, I mean, it would still, I suppose, uh, have value as an unveiling or revealing of the nature of what happened, yeah. uh, whether it was, it was because it doesn't really exist to um, it doesn't really exist to warn anybody there is the tradition uh, that, that the Christian community in Jerusalem was warned by prophets I think prophets in the community themselves to flee so that when the Romans came the Christian community had substantially left and we're going to see allusions to that in Revelation uh, so there was a prophetic message but John uh, was not living in Israel, was living you know, in, in Asia Minor, in, in Ephesus, in his exile. So he is seeing in that place something pertaining to, to some things down in Israel. And that's where Josephus is, is not writing, he's not writing about Asia Minor, just about Israel. One, one thing to note, because I want to, when we talk about judgment coming, maybe to, to I think a, a note is important to make this a little bit more because um, you could say, well, God brought judgment to Israel. So, well, no, they just rebelled against Rome and Rome, you know, kicked their butt. But judgment and natural consequence of actions, you know, often go hand in hand. The, 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 the reality, I mean, just in terms of Israel rejecting her true king and then fighting for an independence against Caesar to set up some other thing led to this catastrophe um, on a, if you're looking for just on the ground causes um, but the, 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 the net effect is still that having rejected God's will you they fell into this this circumstance much like um, we can say in our lives about ways we might experience God's maybe discipline that we act disobediently and something happens to us, we just God's judgment, it's also to be the natural consequence of what we did because God's judgments and God has set up a world in which rebelling against him leads to certain things. And, and, it's, and so the, I, I'm just saying that the merger of the idea that God is judging and the idea that this is the natural consequence of one's actions, that, that there's no conflict there. I mean... Yeah, so, 
what, what happened in the rebellion of Israel in, in AD leading up is so that these independence movements took root, you know, after the crucifixion and and everyone wanted to throw off Rome. And actually, the, Jew, the Jewish revolutionaries actually managed to to overthrow the local Roman rulers and take control of Israel. And so in Rome, they just said, okay, enough. Uh, now, it had been, been a hundred years of dealing with Jewish rebellion. And then finally, they sent in uh, an accomplished general with a large army, and they besieged the city and dealt with it. Putting, putting an end to it. So. Okay. All right. Any other qu introductory kinds of questions? Um, let's open up to Revelation and read some actual text, which always is the best way to understand what anything means. As one man once said, uh, it's amazing how much light the Bible sheds in the commentaries. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Revelation chapter. We may have different translations. That's okay. If something in your translation sounds a little different than mine, um, feel free to, to highlight it. Uh, I'm reading out of the, a New King James translation, which I like because it has a literal convention that helps make my mind wrap around what's happening in text. But, that, but feel, feel, feel free to speak up with something else that says something a little bit different. So Rev, let's, let's start with, um, with let's start reading it at verse 1. And I may go around and let other people read during this, so be prepared. <clears throat> the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he signified it by his angel to his servant John. A couple notes there. Sometimes we, we call it, it's been historically called the revelation of St. John the Divine, but it's very clear in the text that the revelation of Jesus Christ. The word revelation there is the Greek word apocalypse. And sometimes the apocalypse, is, if we think of the word, means destruction and you know, the apocalypse. But apocalypse means revealing, not destruction. Um, so the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, which God gave him, which God gave Jesus to show his servants. So the Son is revealing the will of the Father to his servants. And what he's revealing is things which must shortly take place. 68 to 70. Yeah, I mean, I, I just want to highlight again to, to, to stay with the text itself something that has, the horizon of him, which was 2,000 years, though we know with the Lord the day is just 1,000 years and all that kind of stuff, but the plain sense of it, things which must shortly take place seem to refer to things that are going to happen pretty soon. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. God gave it to Jesus, who gives it to his servants. And he, Jesus, sent and signified it. Now, what would that mean, signified it? Authenticated it. What's that? Authenticated it. Well, I think it, it probably refers here to the, this, the highly symbolic language. Of revelation, he he signified it. He he gave the signs of it to John. But when it's by an angel, yes, his angel that makes you start thinking how that's not like a nice bishop walking with black clothes on. It's like an angel is more like something floaty. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're pretty. They're pretty awesome in, in the in the New Testament. So usually the angels, the, the the most common thing is for an angel to be mistaken for God, yeah. and and we'll get that revelation where John's going to worship and he says, "Don't do that. I'm just like you, <laughs> or or just like you will be when you're done with this." Significant difference here, though, too, is like I think pretty much every other place where an angel shows up, uh, 
most of the other places in the angel shows up, everyone's afraid they're about to die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then John doesn't doesn't have that, and Peter, as far as I remember, doesn't have that too. And he's in prison in Acts, and the apostles either the guys when they're in prison, the angel leads Saint Peter out. Mm-hmm. Like he's not like like there's there's a there's a sort of familiarity at least there that's interesting to know. But like every other place, everyone like hits the ground and is like, "Don't kill me." <laughs> yeah. the angel, first thing the angel always has to say is, don't be afraid. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Which is ironic, right? Yeah. Well, I think that's a really important point. I, I, you know, and, and I think one central point of Revelation, we'll get this when we get to the scene of worship in chapter um, uh, 4 and 5, is that it does indicate the new and exalted place of God's people. Um, we're going to see in, in Revelation 4 and 5 the 4 and 20 elders, the 24 elders, and again, there's a lot of nonsense because of interpretation of that, but it clearly is meant to represent God's people, and, and who are clearly seated right before the throne of God. Um, and whereas in the Old Testament, only the high priest and only under very certain circumstances could enter in there. Now, because Jesus has entered in there once for all, all of God's people. And St. Paul says this in Ephesians, he says, and, and he raised you up and, and seated you in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So since we're, we can be comfortable in God's presence, we can yeah. interact with angels without it meaning we're going to die. But this also situates us, and again, right from the get-go, it situates us in the prophetic genre. Because in, you know, in taking, for example, like the, the prophecy to Isaiah, for example, Isaiah is cast into this vision in Isaiah 6, right? And, and, and also then it's an angel that mediates sort of the message. Same similar with Ezekiel. The angel is the one who delivers the scroll of Ezekiel saying, eat the scroll, Ezekiel, and, you know, and, and, uh, which is the, the sort of symbolism of him receiving the word that he'll prophesy to the people. So this all, it puts John in this sort of prophetic place. Like it's a, it's a signal, it's a literary signal saying, I'm, this, is, this is the sort of convention we're entering into in terms of how this is going to unfold in this book. It, it also, it also it, 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 and it's a good point, it highlights the sort of authoritative nature of this, which is kind of an idea that, that lays behind historically the idea of apostolic succession, which is that, there's, there, that, that what is being given comes from a, a lineage that is authoritative from God to Jesus to the apostles to the church. Here it's from the Father to the Son to a servant to an angel, John. So it's not it's not John had a general vision out in the plain. Right. He it, it, the source is clearly distinguished, and this has always been actually the distinction because I said I talked about what we call the Gnostic. That may seem people have heard that word before, but the ancient heresy of Gnosticism was rooted in the idea that some some uh, leader had a vision. And the nature of the vision when he saw something and then he communicated it to followers to whom he had the gnosis, Gnostic comes the word for knowledge, and he gave it to people. But the vision he had was, was you know, there was no corresponding witness to it and it didn't come from any authorized source and nobody uh, other than himself really was able to, to authenticate it. Whereas, for example, here at, with John, um, the Father through Jesus to John by an angel, and then even after he writes it, it takes the whole church to say, we recognize this as authoritative. So there's a whole, there's, there's, there's a, an, an, uh, a, a realm of authority um, which is distinct from Gnosticism. Um, there are two preeminent I think the two largest sort of not groups that sort of fit that definition of the Gnostic in the modern world would be our neighbors across the street, the Mormons, and Islam. Because both have leaders who, who, who where the faith originated with a, a vision that they themselves had that no one else authenticated. And it didn't, it, it, that, and that's, that's what characterizes the Gnostic versus the church has always been very incarnational, historical. It, it, you, it, you, you, you verified it. There were four gospel writers, not one. 
there were there was there was always a, a, a community that 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 validated the the, the message. And, and, and so that, that, that's one of the distinctions here. So we get that clearly in verse 1, that this lineage, father, son, uh, to his servants, to an angel, and sent it specifically to John. And John, then in verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Verse 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things that are written for the time is near. Again, time is near. Um, this presumes that Revelation is sort of meant to be read in the liturgical assembly. Blessed is he who reads and they who hear. In other words, John's good, people are going to read this. Also, in a translation of that is uh, of one who reads aloud. Yeah. Uh, and, it's, and it's again kicking back to the prophetic literature, um, which is always about proclamation of the prophetic message, not about. And, and so that's again signaling we're in this prophetic convention. And, and that's, that's a good point that Hayden raises about the idea of prophecy, because I think we're so used to the idea of the prophetic as the predictive. Whereas in the New Testament, the, the, the idea of the New Testament church had prophets. The prophets weren't always going about saying, you know, tomorrow this is going to happen to you or like that. It was more that they were able to proclaim with authority the word of God and as it applied to a given community. Um, so, for example, John's going to prophesy to the seven churches. None of them are strictly predictive. They are messages with, with a living, the, rev the revelatory of the behind the scenes of the sort of immediate spiritual dimension behind the scenes of what's happening in, uh, in the like obvious, and then the cosmic dimension behind all of that too. So it's, a, it's sort of all these dimensions are stacked on each other, have to be seen simultaneously to each other. Incidentally, there are. Uh, Seven Beatitudes, blessed is he in, in um, Revelation uh, 1, 3, 14, 14. But notice as we go through, they'll say that again, which means happy. So if you, so if you hear and, and keep. So verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. And where is Asia? Middle East. What, what country is it today? Turkey. Turkey. So it's sort of on the coast. Um, it, it formed a sort of circuit of churches that would have been probably circulated writings and letters together. Um, it's important to note that there's seven, which is going to have a symbolic. What, what, what does seven represent? Completion, 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 fullness. There's seven days in a week. Completion. It's the complete, in, in Jewish imagination, it's the completion of the creation Sabbath cycle. So it's like the the, the, the work of creation that gives forth into the consummation of creation, which is Sabbath, the seventh day. And this is one case in the book where the number is going to be both real, literal, and symbolic. There are actually seven churches. Uh, but but they represent the fullness of the truth. It's also significant so, for collapsing the Gnostic, um, like working against the Gnosticism of the, that, that prophetic mode because it's couched in history. Um, it's historic. It's like a, there's a there's a there's a there's a literal dimension to this. Even though we've been speaking a lot about like being careful of our literalism, um, there is a literal dimension to all of this too. That is couched in historical events, which. Is significant for setting it over and against like Gnostic visions of prophecy. And, and one of the things we'll see in the, in the letters to seven churches are a word to these churches, but also a word to the church. So its message transcends. And a lot of our hearing of Revelation will depend upon our hearing what God is saying to the churches. It's a living message. Because I think it may be also to get back to. Um, the question that, that Ben asked about, you know, what, how does this apply? In a certain sense, Revelation is going to communicate to us the ongoing reality of the church as the worshiping community. 
hearing the word of God, ascending with him in worship, and our ability to um, to stay in that faithful covenant relationship with God depends upon our listening to his prophetic word to us and responding to it. As he said, blessed are those who read, who hear, and keep the things that are written. So John, the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who was, excuse me, from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. This is a, is a letter, and to some degree this follows a form of ancient letters that they just began in this way, grace and peace, that they didn't have, but they have specific significance in the Christian um, milieu uh, of greeting. Great God's grace to you and, and peace would be shalom, which you'd all be familiar with as shalom, as, as, as it is in our liturgy, peace, coming from the Hebrew shalom, is the result of the covenant. When the covenant has been fulfilled and we are brought into union with God, we have peace. That's why on Easter, Jesus appeared to the apostles and said, Peace, because the covenant has been fulfilled. And so we leave communion with the peace of God. Um, what about this who is and was and is to come? Why, why that language? Eternal. Eternal. Where in the Old Testament do we remember God describing himself in time frame terms? How did he describe himself to Moses? I am. I am. I am. So, um, this draws that out a little bit, but it, it, it to some degree um, plays on that. It, it also plays the idea that he, he was, he, you know, there's a, a pre-existence, there's a current manifestation, there's a future uh, promise uh, to, to what's being said, which is always the three time horizons of our faith. We're always celebrating what God had, what God has done in the past as it applies in the present moment in anticipation of a future fulfillment. God was and is and is to come. And from the seven spirits, what about these seven spirits? I thought there's just one Holy Spirit. Spirit of the church. Can we put our symbolic hat on here? And, and say that, that we would talk about something like the fullness. Which, so the Holy Spirit, you mean described as seven spirits, we talk about fullness. Are there any places in the tree you can remember where with the spirit there's a seven associated with it? Maybe in confirmation. confirmation. Yeah. It's a reference to Isaiah 11, um, which describes the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, okay. or which are sometimes translated as the seven spirits of God. Um, spirit of counsel, might, knowledge, and fear of God, um, etc. Yeah. Just the menorah. I'm like, um, can't help. Yeah. So we're gonna get we're gonna actually get the actual menorah here in a minute. Oh, okay. But um, but that's but that's but Cheryl, you're right. That's that's where the image of seven spirits come from. Is that there are seven lamps burning in the temple, and so it sees the seven spirits, which is the fullness of the spirit. Which is intriguing because it's going to use like temple imagery to again kick back. This is like a Paul, a Pauline notion in, in St. Paul's letters that the the temple represents eternal realities. Like they're like we're like they're, he's going to use I, like this, like tangible icons to represent like things that that to and then telescope us immediately up into the things they've always been representing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So my Bible has a footnote that says that. Or the sevenfold spirit. All right. Either way, we got spirit and seven, right? <laughs> yeah. 
So, and, and notice we're, we're going to get, so we, we've already got um, God, we now we've got the, um, Jesus, uh, we've got the spirits, and now we, now we get it in verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. <coughs> Jesus Christ, in his life and death, was faithful to bear witness to the reality of the Father. That's what that means. It can also refer to um, a small part of the heavenly host. And the fact that before the throne is a position more representative of angelic beings than we, we don't typically think of the Holy Spirit as being before the throne. It's, it's a point that, we, that, that, that could be, although I, I do think it does seem to be referring to the, the, you know, the, the, the sevenfold candlestick that is there that does seem to represent somehow the Spirit of God as opposed from just, I don't think, so I, I, I don't know, it's good. It, it, it does seem that this does mean the divine Spirit as opposed to just created angelic beings. Yeah, it's the it's a it's a it's a product of the ambiguity of that of that translation, whether it means whether it is in fact sevenfold or the seven spirits of God. Because I mean you do have the you know you have in the New Testament you have you cited seven different angelic beings that are said to be in the around the throne of God, um, that Paul gives a list of. Um, mm -hmm. and but at the same time if it's a if it's better translated as sevenfold, then it's referring to the perfect spirit of God, which seems more appropriate to identify as the Spirit. Yeah, I mean, be, because it goes here, John, uh, the one who was on the throne, the, 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 the grace and peace is coming from the throne from and from uh, the spirits. It does seem, and then from Jesus, it does would lead me towards the Holy Spirit interpretation. But. Yeah, it's a Trinitarian image, um, and one that will come actually will also repeat itself several times here, talking about the throne and then. Then the, the Lamb who sits in front of the throne, which is another icon of Christ, and then it'll talk about the, the Spirit sort of moving there in front of the throne as well. And so I think, yeah, I think that if we read it, I think, I think it's better, the better translation, the better interpretation is the Holy Spirit. So Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. Now, here's the beginning of our, of our foray into understanding that, that everything here has some, some old Testament backdrop. There's a, a number of passages that refer to um, the Messiah as the firstborn. Psalm 89, 27 um, says, Also I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Um, The thing that can trip us up in our Christology about the word firstborn is born gives us the image that there was a time when he, when he was not and then he came into being by being born. But the firstborn imagery here is not about chronology but about inheritance. The firstborn son is the heir, so to make him my firstborn is to make him my heir. Um, the um, New Testament passage where this, this uh, is um, is is brought as Colossians one verse fifteen and sixteen. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Which means, which means his preeminent status. But as you know, if you don't want to be guilty of heresy, you know that there was never a time when the Son was not. That's the Trinitarian theology the church worked out um, in the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople in the early church that, that, so, so the, that in the beginning God was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There never was a time when the Father was alone. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. He, he, it's called the eternal generation of the Son. And, and so... There's no time element, and we say 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and never shall be. It always has been. So the firstborn is not a time element, but it's, it's saying that, that Jesus is the heir. <coughs> And, and it goes on to say, this makes it clear in Colossians, because it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. So He is the same verse in Colossians that calls Him the firstborn, also calls Him the Creator. Which kind of, it's kind of interesting with that in, in mind when He was in, uh, before the crucifixion, He was in the garden. And uh, Satan came to tempt him and said, oh, I'll give all this to you. What could he possibly give him? I mean, he could have just stood up and just started laughing at that point. It's like, you know, this is, this is all mine in the first place. So, who are you? Yeah, so it's an interesting thing there, uh, though, um, in the sense that, that this is the nature of all temptation, his temptation, the nature of all temptation. What the devil was saying to him is, you can skip the cross, and I'll give you now something instead at, at, at no cost, simply for worship. Um, and, and to understand the reality of the Christian life, we're in no different situation than Jesus was. We are heirs with him of all things. And so the devil comes to us and says, it offers us all kinds of ways to give us something now rather than walking our way of the cross in obedience and, and entering into our full inheritance. So, so it really was a temptation to avoid the cross. But to him, to Christ, it, there was never a time at which he was not. So in his perspective, Knowing that, knowing his place, knowing God the way he did, was it really a temptation? I mean, at, at that point, it's like, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. There's nothing you could offer me that would change anything. Yeah. It's laughable at that point. I mean... No, I think I think you're right about Jesus' own self-consciousness of not really being truly tempted by it. Although there certainly was an oppression, he he um, felt, and the angels ministered to him after temptation, so he felt the weight of 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 the demonic presence as a human being. I think, yeah, I think Jesus understood just what you're saying. He but was there, feeling it on our behalf. On our behalf, but also it, as a as an actual human being, he he felt the pull of. Of, of, of just of, of just the spiritual reality but I don't think it was really you know like you say he didn't really seriously consider doing that I would just like us all to realize there are inheritance that 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 if we really saw who we are in Christ and our inheritance as clearly as we should none of our temptation would be tempting either because they are all cheap buy-offs for, for what God really has for us so you're right, Jesus is unique in, in his ability to stand firm because he is God, but we're called to be that and to see more clearly. And I think, I think that's also why the more we enter into our, our life of prayer and our understanding of God's promises in the scripture, the less tempting temptation really is. It doesn't mean like we don't feel pulled to it, but it's like, no, I don't, I don't want... I think the way temptation really should work for us is that we we live in this life of prayer with God and Christ and the Spirit. We should be living in this experience. Temptation it pulls us away from that, and that and that's something we the more we're in that more we say it's not worth it. So, um, so I, I agree with you. I just think there's a lesson there for us as well which Revelation will also make clear that way. So firstborn means that. And it's, my point, firstborn is a biblical term, comes from the Old Testament about, about uh, the Messiah being the heir. The, the faith of the firstborn from the dead. And the firstborn from the dead also there means... Um, 
he's it, they also call it the first fruits, which means there's more. He's the firstborn, but we're also raised from the dead as a result of him of, of what he did. And ruler over the kings of the earth. Very important to understand. So we're going to see in, in Revelation, Jesus, the ascended Lord, is ruler over everything. He is Caesar's Lord. And that's something that is, was very um, incendiary in the first century and early centuries. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the confession that was required by Rome of every citizen was that Caesar is Lord. And, and the really, the thing that got the early Christians killed was not that they believed in Jesus or, or any of the particular things. It's, they, it's, it's their belief in Jesus rendered them unable to participate in the cult of the emperor anymore. Because they could not acknowledge that Caesar is Lord because Jesus is Lord. So he, 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 G, the early, the Roman Empire saw the church as a threat because it rebelled against the emperor. Yes. I, think, I think that's one of the things that I have the hardest time with is that, you know, uh, the historical place in which you have to put yourself to understand what they were truly going through because we are so far removed from that societal norm that they struggled with. Not that we don't have struggles, but it's like... Um, a decade ago, we didn't even know what LOL means. So like, when you project back that far, it's hard to really comprehend the, the, the life they led and what, like when you mentioned, you know, first born, what that really meant was, you know, he was the heir and so on and so forth. Whereas today, the first born is that's well, the firstborn. It's the oldest child. You know, it doesn't necessarily give them anything more uh, than the other two that you may have. You know what I'm saying? You love all three of them the same, um, but they're just different in age. Um, so it, it that's one of the things I struggle with is 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 the history and the society and the culture that in which they lived in and how that translates through what we read in the Bible. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I would say two things, though. It's one reason to be, that, that, that being, um, you know, that our, our, our habit of reading Scripture is so important, of course, because, I mean, the, the term firstborn spans biblically, you know, probably a thousand years in terms of usage. So it, it's, it's, it's actually a concept that is bibli timelessly biblical. And as we, as we live in that biblical world, that the biblical story is our story, we become more familiar with that. Also, in terms of the Caesar thing, there's always a timeless struggle between the reality that Jesus is Lord and the tempt of states to, to put a claim on people and usurp some of that prerogative. So there's always a timeless element to, to the idea. And we struggle with that now in the sense that, you know, as, as our culture has gone away from the kind of accepted Christianity into this tension, we'll have more of those, you know, when, when the state might say, you can't do this. And would we, you know, what, what, what happened in such a... Well, ultimately, that's, the point. that's one of the main themes, one of the main takeaways from Revelation is that ultimately every every human kingdom becomes Babylon. Um, becomes the kingdom that demands that demands the loyalty that the Romans, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Assyrians, that everyone demands every kingdom becomes that. That isn't Christ's. Yeah. And, and, that, that, and that would be one of the things that it, it, it pushes us to see uh, every kingdom of the world that way. I didn't realize that we kind of blew through our 8.30 stop time, so we're just going to take a cold stop right here, because I'm trying to be pretty good about that. Start at stop at 7 when we started, so I apologize when 10 minutes is over, but we should give it up. We will, we will aim to finish chapter 1 next time. Um, that will start at 7, and we'll jump into it. Um,
There are some diversions from there uh, to, to look at. So, uh, so read it over, and, and if your Bible has cross references, take a look at those. We'll try to understand what the terms mean, and pick up from there. The Lord be with you. Amen. Let us pray. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make His face to shine upon us. Be gracious unto us. The Lord lift up His countenance upon us and give us peace this night and forevermore. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it fun. We persevered it. I think it'll make more sense as we go. Yeah. 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 Yeah.